So I'm here to talk to you about MySQL in the cloud. And first I'd like to know how many of you actually use MySQL? Okay, that's good. How many of you use cloud providers like Amazon RDS, HP Cloud, Google Cloud SQL? One person, that's impressive. Rackspace Cloud? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, how many of you have problems with RDS or are considering using it or wants to know more about it? Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll try to deliver for something for everybody. So, I'm Colin Charles. I work on MariaDB. Anybody use MariaDB? Okay. Anybody heard of MariaDB? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so my career fo follows a series of acquisitions. For the last um, eight years or so, I've moved from MySQL to Sun, and then multi-program to SkySQL, all, all working on um, MySQL and MariaDB. I've, used, I've worked uh, also on the Fedora project as well as OpenOffice.org. The agenda for today is largely to focus on MySQL, the database as a service offerings that are available. All your choices available. So many RDS users may find that you may want to try something else out, maybe over cost or maybe over what you can get at another service. Things like versions are pretty important. I think um, MySQL is getting better and better with every new release. Despite what some may think that Oracle is stifling development, they're actually putting effort into development. Also, the, I'll talk about, a bit about costs. We'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into RDS, especially if you're a MySQL DBA. For all of you using MySQL and RDS, how many of you are actually MySQL DBAs as well? No. OK. So we probably wouldn't do the EC2 or an equivalent or focus too much on that. So what is MySQL as a service? Database as a service is like software as a service for databases. It just basically means that MySQL is available on demand. You don't have to install it. You don't have to configure it. You don't have to get hardware for it. You don't have to upgrade it. It's as opposed to the old way where you, you, know, you submit a project approval, and then you maybe get the approval, or you, you, you're told by a CFO you can't spend that much money. Or when you finally can, you order the hardware, then you rack and cable it, and then you take it connected to the network, you install and configure the OS, and you start the service. Typically, the old way would take you weeks, maybe. Today, you can start in an instant. Typically, in less than five minutes, you can be up and running with MySQL as a service. Everything here is paper usage based. And your provider maintains MySQL, so you don't have to have a MySQL DBA on board, or you don't have to be a MySQL DBA, because everything is done for you by your provider. The new way of deployment, as opposed to the purchase order, is to just enter a credit card number. And then you call an API with many services, like Amazon or Rackspace or even HP Cloud. You have a front-end GUI, but if you uh, Linux people, you would probably like scripting things along the way, so you can just call an API, just add start start an AMI, and you know off off you off you're going running your database as a service. I also put an option for Nova Boot there because OpenStack is a, another way to roll your own database as a service. How many of you here have private OpenStack installations? Okay, a bunch of you. How many of you use public OpenStack installations? OK. So the typical reason as to why database is a service is usually people just say, why can't we just have a few more servers to handle traffic spikes? DBAs are typically very expensive. Indeed.com has uh, salary listings in, on average in the US, where typically DBAs earn about 91000 on average, whereas a MySQL DBA earns a hundred and 16,000 on average. This uh, goes up tremendously if the MySQL DBA is good, and a good MySQL DBA is usually never out of a job. 
So using the database as a service, you generally can launch services uh, without having DBAs on board because you rely on the service provider more than anything. When I say rapid deployment and scale out, this is also true, but keep in mind that there are limitations. By default, Amazon RDS will tell you uh, allowed 40 instances per account, and then you have to apply for more. And things like Amazon and Rackspace, you think it's one click and then the database starts up. It's, it doesn't work that way. It usually takes even maybe five minutes before the database is provisioned for you. It's not instant provisioning. There's always a time delay, so you can't just scale out instantly. Google Cloud SQL and Rackspace, uh, sorry, Google Cloud SQL and HP Cloud in all my testing is actually the quickest in terms of starting the database up for you and being production ready. HP Cloud is, takes it one step further because you can actually do this via the command line. You can just use Trove command line and then you have running MySQL almost instantly so you can script it relatively well. So you have four choices today. Um, Amazon, the leader in the space, they, they push RDS and then they keep on releasing new features and then other people will generally pay catch up. And you've got both Rackspace and HP Cloud, both based on OpenStack. So they offer similar levels of service quality in terms of what features are available because they follow the OpenStack release model. And then you've got Google Cloud SQL, which is based on something Google has with varying versions of API access. There are obviously more providers out there. Jelastic is a platform as a service offering MySQL, MariaDB. ClearDB is MySQL offered and they partner with Heroku, AppFog, as well as Azure, so if you want to use Heroku, by default you usually get Postgres, but if you want to run MySQL, use ClearDB. Joint offers Procona MySQL, which is a very popular branch of MySQL. The, there are two branches in the MySQL ecosystem that are popular, that's Procona server with ExtraDB and MariaDB. And I, I put Zero on there because they actually gave people literally two weeks notice that they were shutting their services down earlier this May. So if you are going to use a cloud provider, make sure you get a reliable cloud provider because two weeks notice and then having to move your service is not exactly easy, especially if you've relied on the service running for a while. So it was two weeks notice for paid customers and non-paid customers, they were just basically told, okay, we're shutting down. So. And, Z and Zeron was active literally right before they sent the email. They, they were even at a trade show a couple of days before they sent the email. So generally, the bigger companies are probably the ones you want to go for and back and use. I won't be covering GenieDB or ScaleDB or ScaleBase. These are var varying services available around the MySQL ecosystem. They're all commercial, and they do different things. Has anybody heard of scale, scale base, scale DB, or genie DB before? Okay, do you use it? No, okay. Yeah, so we're gonna not cover that, obviously. In the cloud, do you have the concept of regions and availability zones? I don't know how many of you registered here earlier today, and then they said that Reg Online was down, and then you got tags like this. Had Reg Online used the cloud and not the data center, chances of them having services today would still probably be okay. Any of you at LinuxCon in New Orleans? Nope. So it turns out that Reg Online was down then as well, and they are <laughs> and they are servers, the data centers are in Boulder, Colorado, and Colorado had some nasty stuff when LinuxCon New Orleans was happening, I think it was a flood. So the data centers did go down. With the cloud, you have a region, which is basically a data center, and each data center contains multiple availability zones. This diagram is courtesy of Amazon. Each availability zone is isolated from failures from other availability zones, but they have, and they have very low latency connectivity. But the beauty of running this in the cloud is that you don't only have to have your database in one region. You can have multiple regions 
for redundancy. So if your data center does disappear and regions do go away, Amazon this year has been pretty good, but last year they had some pretty catas catastrophic failures. If your region does go away, you should be fine. This is much better than having services go down because you rely on one data center. With regards to OpenStack, zones are roughly comparable to an AWS region. Google follows a similar method to this in understanding what a region in an AZ is. Was that clear for everybody? OK. I think location plays a huge role. AWS, being the largest, has many, many, many regions available. They have varying availability zones in each region. Some have two, some have three, and some have five availability zones. North Virginia probably has five, whereas something like Sao Paulo, uh, Tokyo, and even Sydney have like two or three. Rackspace has Rackspace uses airport codes for availability zones, for, for their regions, and the availability zones inside the regions. So US, the USA is like DFW and so forth. I put an asterisk next to, to London because if you have a Rackspace US-based account, you can't start a region in London. You need to now create a separate region, a separate account in London. That's just not very convenient for rolling out purposes if you wanted to go across regions. What, what, it, it seems to be a rack space limitation, uh, I, maybe for accounting purposes. I've never been able to get a straight answer as to why. I've just been told, set up a second account. It's very odd. Whereas with Amazon, you can start you know, in the US, you can start in Sao Paulo, you can start anywhere you feel like it as long as your credit card can pay for it. The Google Cloud SQL has three availability zones in uh, US Central and two in Europe. Um, they, they don't, they're not very forthcoming as to where the data centers are, so I can't tell you exactly where. And uh, HP Cloud has US East and Virginia, and US West just started um, maybe a couple months ago. And they have three availability zones per region that you can make use of. Rackspace guarantees 100% network uptime, so they generally say you don't need to have multiple availability zones to maintain high uptime. However, the SLA does differ on this, saying that they have 99.9% .9 uptime. So beware SLAs. The fine print is sometimes really important to read. Just the purpose of my next slide. These are the SLAs available, and generally you get 99.95% uptime guaranteed for your relational database service. But all SLAs exclude scheduled maintenance. With 99.95% uptime, it means you can get up to 22 minutes of downtime per month. This means that for 22 minutes, you are not serving your customers. This is why you'll have more than one availability zone, most likely, so that when the backup happens or maintenance happens on one, the other will serve your customers. But when you Factor in scheduled maintenance, this, this figure increases tremendously. This means you can potentially have up to 142 minutes of downtime a month. Now, can you handle that kind of downtime for your application? This is something you obviously need to think about and build in as well. Rackspace at 99.9% .9 in a calendar month offers about 44 minutes of downtime per month. HP Cloud has no SLA yet. In fact, to get access to HP Cloud's database as a service, you have to sign up for an account and then apply for access because it's been in beta now for, I don't know, 16 or 17 months since April of last year. And you have to be approved to get an account. But once you do, it's currently free because it's in beta. When you use cloud providers, I think support is probably also really, really important. With AWS, you get forums by default. For $49 a month, you get access to email at local business hours. You'll get a, rep you'll get a response time within 12 hours. If you pay 100 plus, which is basically 100 plus usage basis, you get like a one hour response time and you are guaranteed to now have someone to call on the phone. This is this is actually quite significant. 
Rackspace, they work very well. They, they sell themselves as a company that has fanatical support, and it's true. Their live chat works, their phone works, their forums work. In fact, the live chat usually can lead to them calling you via the phone. They will call you. Their support is generally really good. With regards to Google, you have just access to forums. You can get support for about $150 a month onwards, and to get a phone number, it's 400 and above. HP Cloud also has pretty good support for a service that isn't charging you now. They will call you. They will also have chat with you. And they have a customer forum that you can access once you log in. So I'd say from in terms of support, so far, Rackspace and HP Cloud are pretty good because being able to call someone is actually useful when things don't work. With regards to management, AWS is completely self. And if you want to get them to manage it for you, you have to pay a huge chunk of money. It starts at 15K a month. Rackspace, is, if Rackspace really does sell managed services because they are a hosting company. Basically, it's $100 as, at the base plus 4 cents over whatever cost they have for the service you're using. This is not bad if you don't want to manage your, the databases yourself. If you don't have any DBAs, for, for example, and you write code that generates queries that may not be necessarily optimized, having someone do this for you is actually handy. Google is self-management as well as HP Cloud. They're all self-management. Uh, frankly, someone who's used MySQL for a long time, been developing on it since 2000, I, I don't see why you'd need to uh, get someone to manage it for you, but I'd say many users who don't have the experience or need consulting and so forth may actually benefit from managed services. MySQL versions are pretty important. MySQL 5.6 came out in February of this year. It's starting to get more traction now, especially since Percona Server 5.6 went GA a couple of weeks ago. With AWS, you get MySQL 5.1, 5.5, and 5.6. Realistically, I don't see why anybody would not launch on 5.6 today. Rackspace, unfortunately, offers MySQL 5.1. In fact, it's 5.166 that comes out standard of Debian. This is really, really old. So I, I can't recommend you to use you know, the Rackspace database service for the sole version that the, the version that is shipping is really old. It's, it's missing out so many useful things like information schema and performance schema. It's missing out on all the extra features you get out of InnoDB, better performance. I've been told Rackspace is looking to upgrade, but at the moment, they haven't. Google ships MySQL uh, Community 5.5. They upgrade generally once every couple of months. Amazon, as you can tell, ships the latest release of MySQL. Basically, every two months, you get a new 5.6 drop. Amazon RDS will have it ready almost instantly. HP Cloud is interesting because they don't ship standard MySQL, but Pocona Server 5.5.33. They, they were shipping, they started with 5.5.28, and they've constantly upgraded. And Pocona Server just released 5.6, so it'd be interesting to see if HP Cloud will offer this in the future, or how they will offer it in the future. But the fact that you're getting a potentially better server than MySQL makes HP Cloud actually quite interesting. Pocona Server, for all intents and purposes, is a superset of standard MySQL from Oracle. It has good features like you know, fast InnoDB restarts and stuff that you don't see inside of stock MySQL. Most of the larger scale people that are running MySQL at scale don't run stock MySQL. They run either their own patch set, Twitter, um, Facebook, Google all have their own patch set, or they run Pocona Server or MariaDB because you're getting much better feature set outside of standard MySQL. With regards to access, AWS has API access. You can also ac access it externally via the MySQL client. You can access it within Amazon. It's got a beautiful GUI. It's, it's got an unmatched GUI compared to anybody else out there. Rackspace gives you a private host name within the Rackspace network. Then you get standard MySQL access as well as API access. Google only allows you to access Cloud SQL through App Engine. And they also have a command line client called GCUtil. 
which is Java based. HP Cloud is kind of interesting because you access it externally via Trove CLI, which is a standard OpenStack tool, and then you can start up the MySQL client. So you control the database using Trove, and then you use the MySQL client. You also get two IP addresses, one internal and one external. And it's quite interesting to note that uh, HP Cloud is a mishmash of OpenStack releases. They have, they have two versions now available. Compute is like at version 12.12. .12. Whereas recently I got the RDBMS upgraded to version 13.6. So it's a mixture of using OpenStack, Folsom, and Grizzly releases. Um, doesn't really affect MySQL, but they keep on changing Trove naturally, and the, the future maybe is Red Dwarf. I'm not too into the OpenStack community, but it's clear that this is an example where you can really play, al play along with OpenStack tools. Also, with HP Cloud, you have to remember that when you use the Trove CLI, they actually have a project tenant ID at, at the top. You have a project name, and then when you use, look at it via API access, you have to see a project tenant ID. Make sure you use your project name and not the project tenant ID. Otherwise, Trove will fail. There is no GUI in terms of setting up HP Cloud, MySQL databases. You have to use the Trove CLI. It's completely all via API access. This is a graph taken from MySQL performance blog about uh, information schema uh, variables that are available. Generally speaking, you don't have access to my.cnf, so if you are wanting to control your MySQL, it is very hard to do it with these services. Things like Amazon, RDS provide things like parameter groups, which, so which allow you to control some things, if you know what you're doing, but not all things. MySQL 5.6 provides 523 options, uh, which you can see on the left-hand side of the graph. Whereas in RDS, you only see 283 options available. And some of them are not changeable. They're immutable options, like you know, base directory, data directory, and so forth. You also don't get access to things like audit logs, the memcached daemon. MySQL 5.6 ships with the memcached protocol built in with InnoDB as a backing store. You don't get to change the binary log settings in MySQL, so you can't maybe turn off durability if you wanted to when you're doing inserts. You don't get to change relay log settings. The GUI doesn't have performance schema available. You can't have semi-synchronous replication plugin enabled. And you don't have things like SSL or access to the thread pool. The thread pool is interesting because standard MySQL community doesn't ship with it. You have to pay Oracle for MySQL Enterprise. And what is the thread pool good for? Instead of opening up one thread per connection, the thread pool will open up a pool of threads that will now keep on reusing, those, reusing just those threads. So if you have many short running queries, you don't open up one thread per connection. MariaDB has an open source version of this, and Percona ported it into Percona Server 5.5 and 5.6. Um, but if you're using standard Oracle MySQL community, you do not get this feature. And this is kind of useful, because uh, a real world example is is anybody here familiar with uh, the service called KakaoTalk? Nope. Anybody familiar with WhatsApp? OK, Line. OK, KakaoTalk is the, is, is the Korean equivalent of WhatsApp. And they, they fully use Fusion IO storage as well as MariaDB because of the thread pool for messaging purposes. It actually really gives them much, much better performance when they have the thread pool enabled. So not having the thread pool is actually kind of a, a bummer when you're using MySQL community, even up to 5.6. Cost changes so rapidly that there's no point in you know, even listing it here. You better subscribe to all the relevant newsletters if, of the services you used. Uh, don't, don't forget network access costs. Many people uh, don't factor this in, and then they say, hey, I, I estimated the cost to be x, but now it's x plus y. y. In fact, you can monitor your costs daily or hourly even. There is a wonderful little script by Ronald Bradford available that may benefit you, showing you if you might want to switch instances and so forth. In fact, um, in September, 
Amazon released another new high memory instance with 244 gigs of RAM available. And this is called a DBCR1 eight times large. And you get 3.6 times more memory, 3.4 times more compute capacity over the previous largest instance, which was the DBM2 4x large. But the costs are only about two times greater. So if you were maybe having three read replicas previously, you might now be able to reduce it and save money. And for people that really use Amazon services, I think the Netflix people are, are wonderful because they always publish their tools and all their experiences. And every day using Amazon for them gets cheaper, which is what keeps their share price going up higher daily. Cloud services get cheaper daily, not more expensive. And usually if one drops the charge, everybody else follows suit as well. AWS pricing varies between regions. In the US, you get the cheapest pricing. EU and Singapore, Asia is about matched. Sao Paulo is the most expensive. But if you want to use spot instances, sometimes Sao Paulo is the cheapest because you sort of maybe, or, or reserve or, or bid for instances, you might actually save money in Sao Paulo for benchmark purposes and so forth. This is a list that's available. This is not what you see on the, st on the standard Amazon website. This is actually from Wikipedia, which actually looks like a, a much more digestible view. But as I said, pricing keeps on changing so often that it's really not worth talking about. However, you probably do want recommendations on what you do end up using. And if you are testing RDS, the medium instance with about four gigs of RAM is probably what you want to go for. You probably won't run that in production. If you want to start with a production ready instance, the large instance with 7.5 gigs of, of RAM is generally production ready and will cost you without you, you know, paying them up in advance about 4,700 a year. Of course, the XL and the M and so forth start becoming even more interesting. They obviously start costing a lot more. And an example of when you may want to think about getting hardware is a uh, top of the line Dell with about 512 gigabytes of RAM today would set you back about 19,000 with the best storage you can get like a, on the Dell, I think it's like the R910. After you pay data center costs, maybe you don't want to be running something like the M24XL if you're just running one instance. It's well worth thinking about looking at if the cloud is really cheaper for you or if hardware is also maybe the choice you, you want to go down. Rackspace has also, again, I, I, I have four gigabyte instances for testing and eight gigabyte instances starting for production is maybe a little cheaper. I'd suggest you generally look at the IO priority that you get. Amazon offers something called provisioned IOPS, which is something you don't get on these other services yet. Uh, but so I, I'd look at Rackspace's IO priority and the actual transactions per second you get. So before choosing a cloud provider, instead of just running Sysbench, actually benchmark your app against the cloud provider. Sysbench is, is wonderful for non-real world tests, just like dbt3 and so forth. Google actually makes it quite difficult for you to start paying them money. You have to actually enable billing. So you think by signing up, you would already have a service going, but you actually have to turn it on. And then they also offer equivalents. They all have different names like D8 and D16. And they try to sell you on packages more than anything. And they're generally cheaper than pay-per-use billing plans. Google and AWS both offer these free tiers. Like if you are a startup, they will give you free credits. It's well worth checking them out during those free credit days. HP Cloud, it's, it's currently free. It's in beta, so there's no SLA. Don't run your production stuff on this. It may go away. It, I highly doubt it, though, but 
it will probably start costing you money at some stage. It has been free since last April, though. So it's uh, not a bad bet for being free. Typically, you'd host your applications in the same compute clusters that you're running your database as a service. It would be unwise to have your database as a service on RDS and host your compute clusters at HP Cloud. This also greatly limits your language choice. Most don't have language limitations, but if you do choose to go the Google route, App Engine limits what languages you can use. And for example, PHP only started being available there a couple of months ago. It was mostly Java and Python before that. So if you wanted to run your Ruby on Rails application, you'd automatically remove the choice of having it on App Engine or using Google Cloud SQL. On RDS, you have the option to turn on multi-availability zones. It increases the cost maybe by about 50%. You get enhanced durability because they guarantee synchronous data replication. So it's quite likely that underneath it, they've implemented DRBD, the Distributed Replication Block Device, which is like Ethernet over RAID. You get increased availability, which is you know, known as automatic failover. But this can be slow in production. Automatic failover isn't instantaneous. It has very, very good administration via the GUI. But you really don't have a, another read replica. You are you're actually paying the 50% extra cost for the enhanced durability. Now, if you weren't running RDS and you were running this inside EC2, you can get this via some, a tool like MHA. If you wanted automatic failover, MHA is a great tool that handles automatic failover in use, even at Facebook, at um, DAPA in, in, in South Korea, which is their, their defense ministry, and so forth. So multi-AZ is great if you don't have a DBA on board, but if you do have a DBA or op staff, it kind of makes sense to maybe start thinking about using something like MHA. With MySQL 5.6, you can finally have external replication outside of, from RDS to a non-RDS instance. This was not possible before. Now you can actually have binary log access if you turn on backup retention. Rackspace replicates internally to other systems, and uh, Google Cloud SQL is also internal. It is possible with HP Cloud to actually replicate externally as well, once you've enabled it from the 12 CLI. Replicating into RDS is kind of interesting, because you may want to migrate into RDS or expand using RDS. And the best tool for that is Tungsten Replicator. There is a talk here by someone from Tungsten. I, I saw this on the schedule. I don't know if it's today or another day. But check out the talk. It's, it's, by, it's by a guy from Continuant. The thing about Tungsten Replicator is, is it rewrites the replication. It sort of is, is a middleware that rewrites the replication layer of MySQL. And you can then also get it to fan into maybe like the Rackspace cloud and so forth. You're not just locked in into sending data into RDS. You, set, you can send data to more places. This is kind of useful. MySQL 5.6 and RDS is really what you should be using if you are starting out today. It has many, many, many cool features, which are listed up there, which I'm not going to read. But if you wanted to use something like MariaDB 10, where you get things like multi-source replication, better global transaction IDs that, you know, that don't require your servers to restart, you want the thread pool, and so on. Or if you want to even use Percona server, you're kind of out of luck if you're using a database as a service. You, your, your real option is to then use the compute services and then run the server on top of it as well. Performance schema in 5.6 is, is great because it really instruments your application. Though if you've already run this in production for a long time and you know that you don't need instrumentation per se, the option to disable the performance schema is not available inside RDS, but you can do this if you're running your own compute units. Performance schema has a performance trade-off to your actual servers of maybe up to about 10% in benchmarks. So this is something you'd want to think about if you're running you know, multi uh, multiple instances that you can't quite disable inside of something like RDS. 
And it's also not inside the web UI. You have to get access to this via the SQL client. To import data into the cloud, MySQL dump is generally the recommended choice by everybody, all, all providers. With the exception of Google Cloud SQL, they, they also allow you to import the data, but you have to have your data inside Google Cloud Storage. Things like H HP Cloud and RDS, you can, you can pipe MySQL dump and just get, it, get, get your data loaded. One thing that's a real bummer, and this is the only one that RDS has run into because they have multiple versions of MySQL available, is that if you want to upgrade from 5.5 MySQL to MySQL 5.6, there is no online upgrade mechanism. The only way is to MySQL dump and reload your data. This is kind of retarded. This, is, this, is, this means you're going to have to run two instances, and this is not, not a good option. I'd love to see how HP Cloud handles this in production at some stage because they are also going to have to move from 5.5 to 5.6. This is actually one of the major stumbling blocks of RDS that many people have complained about in the last four to five months as they started offering 5.6. Because people have relied on RDS so much for MySQL 5.5, they want all the cool features in MySQL 5.6, but they really, really don't want to do MySQL dump and reload. With regards to handling backups, one thing you don't get with all these providers is you don't get extra backup. Extra backup is kind of handy, as opposed to just MySQL dump. We believe Amazon, will, via its automated backups, generally use EBS snapshots underneath. You can also create your own snapshots and save it in S3. S3 storage is generally pretty cheap. Um, they have full daily snapshots during the backup window. Rackspace and HP Cloud don't quite mention how backups are handled at the moment, so I, I can't quite give you more information. If you're using any of these cloud providers, mo your monitoring options are severely limited. AWS naturally has the best options with the prettiest graphs available. It's still not what you can get if you used Nagios, Cacti, or Ganglia yourselves but it's, it's the best that's available. Google has very, very basic read-write graphs that are almost laughable, so I wouldn't really recommend that. You can, with HP Cloud at least, uh, monitor externally, maybe start up a, a compute instance and then have something running there as well. But that also involves you kind of you know, doing database administration work and figuring out how to be a DBA. So I guess many of these services have a lot to do with the GUI to fix it so that it becomes more AWS-like. MySQL ships a storage engine layer, and there are many, many cool storage engines, like TalkyDB offers fractal tree indexes, so they claim very, very fast insert performance over InnoDB which does balance B tree in B plus tree in indexes. Spider, which does vertical partitioning for you automatically, so you still it looks like you're talking to one MySQL instance, but it's vertically sharded your data for you automatically. Kind of cool. Connect Storage Engine allows you to connect to a Oracle ODBC source or a SQL Server ODBC source and then join that data with stock MySQL. Or the Cassandra storage engine, which allows you to write directly to Cassandra cluster or pull data out of a Cassandra cluster. And one thing I didn't put up on the slide there is there's also a HBase storage engine called Honeycomb that allows you to pull and push data out of HBase. Yeah, if you're using the cloud, you can't use any of this. You really have your options to use InnoDB or MyISM if it's in the database as a service. In fact, MyISM on RDS doesn't, get, doesn't guarantee point-in-time recovery either, or snapshots, or restores, because My, MyISM is a non-transactional storage engine. I don't know why you'd still use MyISM today, so InnoDB is probably the way to go. But the other cooler engines that you want to use, if you wanted to play with this, you'd have to actually use something like EC2 or a compute instance and then install My, MySQL or MariaDB yourself. With regards to high availability, you should plan for node failures. I, I, I always say don't assume that node provisioning is quick, and this is absolutely true for things like Amazon. It does take time to provision your node. Always make backups. 
if you have bad nodes, sometimes the node doesn't give you as much performance as you were hoping for. Kill the node and start it up. Don't get don't get um, you know attached to your node. You don't because that's because with Amazon, for example, they have varying levels of hardware available. Sometimes you really do get bad hardware underneath it or old hardware underneath it more accurately. HA is also not equal across all the options. RDS so far has the best avail uh, high availability, also via GUI. Unsupported features. With HP Cloud, you actually get uh, full MySQL. AWS, doesn't, even though you have 5.6, it doesn't support global transaction IDs. You can't have InnoDB cache warming, so pre-warm the buffer cache, buffer pool. You can't use the authentication plugins, no semi-sync replication. Google, in, in fact, doesn't allow you to use user-defined functions. You can't load data. You can't install plugins. So they're all limitations. Again, this is mostly in the documentation. They don't tell you this before you start using the service, so you better read the docs first before you start using the service. Provision DIOPS is pretty cool. Currently, it's limited to 3 terabytes of storage and 30,000 IOPS per database instance. It's available on Amazon. Uh, keep in mind that um, if you're running a database at scale, provision IOPS probably makes a lot of sense to, to pay for. You get a, a lot better predictable I.O. It's got very, very good throughput. It's RAID-backed. Provisioned IOPS is probably better than just raiding the stuff yourself in EC2. Because you can take provisioned IOPS up and down dynamically to with with the parameters that you set. So provisioned IOPS is probably something good to use. The problem with all these cloud providers is that you don't quite get access to your slow query log and general query log easily. You get it you get it via an API. This also means you don't get things like super access. So if you get like a replication error, you can't skip them easily. You can't turn off durability if you wanted to. You can't run tools like SAR, PS, TCP dump. So you can't run the very good Percona toolkit against uh, RDS instance or uh, instance in the cloud. Uh, so log forensics are definitely slower because now you get them via the API, then you have to pass them offline. Boto is a pretty good tool that comes for, that comes for Amazon AWS. It's not the official tool yet, but I believe the guy now works at Amazon, so it may become the official tool eventually. So Boto is better than the stock EC2, uh, EC2 and RDS tools that you get from Amazon. Uh, warning, case in point, automatic upgrades are really bad because regressions in MySQL happen even in minor versions. You don't have control over this because the cloud providers will upgrade minor versions for you automatically. We've seen um, things like the query cache will be disabled for partition tables from a one version bump. And if you do rely on the query cache, this is really annoying because suddenly it's gone. So um, MySQL has generally got a, a good test suite, good release policy, but sometimes it's written by humans, so we do fail. And sometimes um, these minor version upgrades can cause your application to actually have serious performance degradation. So you always want to read the change logs. There are two types of benchmarks you can use, either Sysbench or the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. We don't have too much time for this, so we're going to skip it. There don't seem to be any public roadmaps from these cloud providers. So you will find out when there's a change from the newsletters, the blogs, and so on. I expect more will eventually have MySQL 5.6 available for you. Google has made a public commitment to move to MariaDB, so it's unlikely you will get MySQL 5.6, but MariaDB 10. Um, Rackspace is still offering MySQL 5.1, so I sincerely hope that they choose something more modern soon. If you are planning to run things at scale, and one of the things that many, many, many people end up doing is they end up running MySQL inside EC2 
And here you can replace EC2 with the same compute unit that you get from a provider like HP or even Rackspace. And the benefits are clear because you can do things like, you know, multiple geographic replication. You can have your regions via replication. You can, you can also run Pocona Server or MariaDB as opposed to stock MySQL. You can run, um, you can use SSD back storage. You can monitor with whatever tools that make sense to you, especially if you are a seasoned MySQL DBA. You can still make your snapshot backups and save them in S3. You can also use spot instances and save money. Automatic failover can come via MHA. But I think one of the cool things that you could probably do is also run something like Galera Cluster. Galera Cluster promises um, fully synchronous replication. It, it, is, it will scale your reads and your writes, so you don't need to worry about having shards. So it's multi-master. And Galera is something you can run inside a compute cluster. And then you can, inside one region, you can say, hey, I want to have Galera Cluster fully synced here. And then to another region, you can do uh, regular replication and then have that also running Galera at fully synced, fully synced mode. That's generally quite good and you can build something much, much better than just RDS. And you can also use something like MyDumper for parallel dump and load, which is something you cannot do um, with MySQL dump, which is not parallel based. Of course, doing this requires the fact that you now actually have to have a MySQL DBA on board. And Galera is has been around now for maybe a, about two years in, in production use in multiple places, but it also requires understanding new technology. So some very quick closing thoughts before I run out of time. Hardware really does vary per region. You would be surprised to note that, or you may not be surprised to note that you can get much newer hardware, say in Sydney on Amazon RDS than you can get in say North Virginia or you can get better hardware in Portland, Oregon than you can get in North Virginia. Software manageability can vary per region. Uh, this is kind of true with both uh, HP Cloud's US East and US West options. And again, I think it has something to do with the fact that they do run various versions of OpenStack. Rackspace Cloud, uh, in multiple amounts of testing could have runaway databases from the GUI and that would require you to poke support via live chat and then they would have to call an ops team later to kill the runaway instance for you. I didn't encounter runaway instances in any other uh, platform so far. It's really easy to put uh, these costs on your credit card. If you have an Amex with no limit, this could be bad for you at the end of the month. Also, I highly recommend adding a backup credit card because um, when you finally do run out of limit on one card, you should probably have a backup or your servers will stop running. Google and Amazon allow backup credit card at the moment, the others don't. So having backup payment method makes a lot of sense. And the, the guy walked back and said, I have one minute remaining, so now you can ask me questions. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? Is, is there any solution for you build your own database services? Like uh, when I build my own? Your, your own RDS equivalent. Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, I, I think that's OpenStack for the, o OpenStack allows you to build your own database as a service. I think that's exactly what Rackspace and HP Cloud are doing. They had a release maybe recently or will have a release soon. Um, I can't tell you much more than that besides that you need to actually know Rackspace, uh, you need to know OpenStack and build it. But the other cloud providers like Eucalyptus also offers you something that you can do relatively easily. So yes, there are, there are, there are solutions to varying levels of manageability available. Most of, these, most of the cloud providers, um, open source cloud providers like OpenStack and so forth allow you to do this to some extent. So yes, you can build it. Can you build an equivalent to RDS with the nice GUI? Not yet, but I, I guess eventually that'll happen. It, it, or it has to happen. Yes. Uh, would you say the uh, new clusters are better than temporal farming, or is it just? Uh... 
the Galera cluster. Yeah, actually, you don't have to shard with the Galera cluster. That's the beauty of it because um, it is uh, fully it, it is fully synchronous. So either um, <laughs> either all e either your transaction is committed to all nodes or no nodes. So this is kind of what people have wanted in uh, MySQL for a long time that they didn't get. And Galera is not just new; like it's it's been being developed for the, like the last six or so years. It's been funded by the Finnish government, and and in production now in excess of maybe 100 odd installations. And it's made by a company called Codership, but backed by all the major MySQL players that are not Oracle. So that's a good sign. I've been told to stop. So thank you for listening. <laughs> and if you have questions, I'll be around all week. <laughs>